Okay, welcome to BransonOffGrid.com, which goes to my YouTube channel of the same name. <clears throat> Almost put this off too far, but too long, but I was trying to do a uh, basically a conceptual uh, video showing how you might uh, wire up a system. Uh, it's very simplistic in a lot of ways. Obviously, there's more wire, actual wiring than what I have here on the drawing, but uh, this is just show you the component uh, overview and uh, how I repurposed my previous uh, solar batteries and that kind of thing and uh, what it would take to do that. And then I added some, uh, trying to add some more. And then oddly enough, uh, this Aquion saltwater battery that I'm featuring here in this video, and you can see on the other videos, uh, they uh, went into bankruptcy a few days ago. So that's uh, not good news, but uh, as far as it takes, it's not a technology problem with the battery, it's a uh, funding problem as is with anything else, trying to get up to uh, build the battery and economies of scale and all that kind of thing. Uh, the battery is very good for specific uh, uses, especially microgrids and off-grid customers, I think is where its uh, forte is, and uh, not necessarily grid storage, although that's kind of where they started with it. So. Uh, it's a great battery. Like I say, I don't think it was a technology problem at all. In fact, uh, it seems like it holds up very well. It's uh, very abuse tolerant and it has a lot of uh, excellent qual uh, qualities, especially for off-grid customers, residential or otherwise. So what I've drawn out here on a video, <clears throat> on this chart, which we're going to show in a video. Let's just scan down and look at the bottom of it while we're here. Tried to add a couple different things that could be used for your off-grid system. One of the biggest problems with off-grid is just like anything else, uh, you end up wasting power in the middle of the day once your uh, system is charged up. So I have uh, just this one Aquion. Now we'll scan in here and look at it. So. These are my uh, solar panels here at the top, which I've shown. Go through a DC combiner, come down to Outback FlexMax controllers, and those charge the battery, and then the uh, inverters, these are off-grid inverters, magnums, which work off the battery power that's 48 volts, and then they output 220. That goes into an E-panel, and then the output from the E-panel feeds the house uh, loads in other words and then there's some other things which we'll cover so that's the basic conceptual idea and uh, then I've got my old uh, series battery set here which is lead acid 48 volt and then that comes into a separate charge controller out back goes back to a transfer switch so on one side of my solar panels here let's just look at this you can have uh, solar panels are mounted uh, series parallel, so depending on how many strings you have up there, uh, how much voltage and the amperage, everything has to be calculated out so you don't over amp something or over volt, put too much voltage on your charge controller, for example, by not having your uh, too many panels in your strings, that kind of thing. So someone has to figure all that out. You really kind of start with the uh, battery uh, technology in a sense and what the battery is going to need. You kind of start with an off-grid system thinking about uh, the battery in essence. And then uh, you got to think about upgrading later on. So if you're not really doing uh, what you want long term, you've got to think about, okay, well, if I upgrade my system, what, how might I... You know what might I do uh, later on? Add more panels, more charge controllers, more battery. How do I make sure the system can be added to uh, with the least amount of uh, trouble, yet still work uh, and everything work together in harmony uh, as you're building it? So you have to give a lot of thoughts to that. So someone who's doing your solar installation for you generally uh, works out all these numbers, the wire sizes, the type of wire, depending on what your system uh, has to be whether you're mounting on the roof or mounting uh, panels out in the yard and that kind of thing, ground mount. So uh, all that kind of has to be taken into consideration. So somebody has to uh, think about the design. There are some prepackaged uh, systems on the web which you can buy if you want to uh, uh, just get something that you know where everything's compatible. Maybe, uh, you know, that's an easy way for a lot of people to do it just to get going. But uh, 
generally most people I think would probably call a local uh, solar installer and start with them get the ideas about what type of equipment uh, you know most installers generally probably work with Schneider or Outback or Magnum or whatever and they just kind of sell their equipment uh, maybe that's what they're familiar with maybe they have a couple different ones in mind that they work with on a regular basis and they're familiar with uh, you know each one has kind of a different way of powering it up different uh, wiring considerations and so forth to some extent but it's pretty general at any rate uh, here what we have on this system is seven kilowatts of power so I've got uh, I can show you on the left side for example I have uh, uh, different size panels because uh, the set of three on the right is uh, an older set so we used uh, three panels in series and the output of that runs at a little bit higher voltage than the ones on the left which are newer panels larger panels so 315 uh, and those are uh, Canadian solar panels uh, 315 uh, watt I believe is what we had on the last set so uh, basically you figure out what kind of uh, and it works a little bit better in reality. Uh, the left set uh, might run at a high of about 80, 90 volts, something like that, where the set on the right runs up around 120. So they do have a little bit different uh, in the way they charge. One charges a little better in the morning, one charges a little better in the evening. So it actually works very well that way. Uh, since the uh, charge controllers take care of the uh, charging, uh, once it gets there, it doesn't really matter that one set's uh, charging at one uh, one voltage, one's at the other. It just doesn't matter. Uh, the only thing the charge controllers really care about is you don't put too much voltage into them, which might uh, damage them. Uh, these outbacks run uh, up to 150 volts, 80 amps. That's the FM80. So as long as you don't overdo it, and you generally want to stay well within the range of your components so you don't uh, stress them, uh, you know, on a grid, a large grid scale, they might stress out their components and try to run at maximum capacity because they've got, if they do blow something up, they've got an extra one and they just put it in. But on a uh, residential off-grid, you want to stay well within the capacity of your components. And uh, so when you design it, you want to think about that. But your panels, series parallel, which is kind of what I've drawn there, they come down to a DC combiner, which has breakers on each, on each string. And then from those, and I just kind of drew the left one. I didn't have to make them all, draw all the wires up there. I left a few of the wiring out. So string one, 12 panels, 3,500 watts. You go through a DC combiner. That goes through a breaker. And actually that breaker is down, uh, mounted physically on the midnight uh, solar E panel. But that power coming in goes into a charge controller and basically it's just two wires a positive and negative it's a lot like connecting a battery in a sense the whole system is so uh, two two wires in two wires out two wires out go directly down to your battery and then uh, as you can see let me just go on down and look at this two wires out goes down positive and negative to your battery two wires out of the other one same thing two wires in two wires out and they just uh, parallel on the battery and that charges the battery with up to about uh, your highest voltage you're going to see on that's about 59 and a half on this Acquia and each battery is going to have a different uh, charge uh, a logarithm I guess you'd call it uh, so each one's going to be programmed specifically for the battery so Charging an Aquion uh, saltwater battery is not going to be the same profile as charging a lead acid, for example. Now, <clears throat> from the battery, if you had multiple batteries, which uh, here it would be uh, actually really good on these Aquions to have at least two, and those are 30 uh, kilowatt hour or 30 kilowatts of storage in those batteries. That's a module. For fifteen thousand dollars, of course, uh, like I said, they're just uh, kind of out of business at the moment. But they're trying to sell their assets, and hopefully, somebody else will get on it and start selling them again. Output from your battery is forty-eight volts into your uh, inverters. Uh, I guess I kind of wrote on there on the left one, Magnum Energy. They're forty-four hundred watt, two hundred twenty volts inverters, 
and they're in a master-slave type system. And in a master-slave, you have a, a router, and the Magnum router just uh, manages your master-slave configuration so that it's working properly. Sorry, I have to move this around a little bit, but uh, it's probably the best way to do it. And you should be able to read it easier. <clears throat> so you can have up to four of these uh, inverters. These two 4,400-watt uh, inverters will give you about, oh, 70 to 80 amps continuous, in other words. Uh, at 100% duty cycle, you could say 80 amps. But 80 amps uh, continuous draw is a little bit too much for the at one Aquion saltwater battery, which I say is uh, for a typical house, one Aquion really isn't going to give you enough uh, amperage draw continuous. Uh, so you have to kind of work around that. Uh, <clears throat> Try, you know, of course, uh, you know, if you're home all day and that kind of thing, you can switch things on and off, do uh, some cooking, and you got, we're, this is a completely ele electric home, so you got your hot water, which is on a timer, the t and that only comes on between, say, 10 and 3 uh, when you've got the most sun. You've got that power coming in off those uh, charge controllers, offsets the power going to the uh, hot water heater, for example. If you can cook in the middle of the day, that's great. Generally, you can't. Uh, generally, your cooking is going to be early in the morning or later in the evening. So if you can split things up and pull a little power here, a little power there, and all that kind of thing, that, that really helps. And you've got this extra power between 10 and 3 because you've got full sun. You've got all this power coming in. If your battery charges up and gets charged up, now you're kind of wasting that incoming power. So you want to try to use as much in the middle of the day but most people can't necessarily do that unless they're at home. Even then, like I say, they're not necessarily cooking and that kind of thing. So it's a uh, having more battery. Uh, the whole key to any off-grid is, is really battery. But uh, this is a good combination for what I've got drawn out here. It works well. It could just have more battery, just like any other system. Now on this other side, uh, string two still comes down through a combiner. And on this one, I go through a transfer switch. And the reason I'm doing the input from the solar through a transfer switch is so I can charge up this extra set of lead acid batteries, which takes a different charging logarithm to, to charge that versus the Aquion. So basically, uh, just you can see I've got kind of a plug drawn in right there. But what that is, is the batteries in the CV down here. And this is... Uh, not mine, just a sample. I've got some other videos which go into great detail on that, but this is uh, basically what I have is a Polaris Ranger EV, which has a 48 volt battery string. So I took my old uh, Trojan batteries, which you can see in that video, which I've kind of drawn out here. The 48 volt output goes through a plug. So I walk over, plug in the EV to another FM80 charge controller. And then I walk over and throw the switch, and this is all it really looks like here. You've just got the input from the solar, goes to a switch. I throw the switch, it can go over and charge these batteries, or it can go over and charge the Aquion. So that's the basics of it. Back out a little bit. So all that's really going on there, I just uh, switch the input from the solar panels on half of my system, and in about if the batteries are really low, maybe three, three and a half hours, whatever, and it'll charge those up. And it, like I said, I try to do that right in the middle of the day, uh, maybe by 10, 11 o'clock. If my battery looks pretty full, then I throw and take half of that power, throw it over, charge the EV with it. And uh, I've been looking at a Chevrolet uh, Bolt, and of course, uh, there's the Tesla, which I drew down here. The other thing that would actually be good is I drew this... Uh, electric motorcycle or I should say I put a picture of it here and you can get a level 2 uh, what they call a charge tank in that so you can charge it off of a level 2 charger and probably it only uses a uh, 30 amp level 2 but still that could take uh, part of my output from my system and charge that or I drew down here or to keep, to keep saying I drew it but to put a picture on here of a drone basically and you'll see these probably this year there's a number of these where people have uh, designed them to fly themselves from point A to point B 
There's about five companies right now. You see that has a 500 pound payload. So that would, could easily take a person from point A to point B and that's the idea. There's companies like Uber and others. There's at least five that are petitioning our government to allow them to uh, fly people from point A to point B with various uh, technologies, but it's basically drone technology, which that is. And in fact, they're doing another one that has, I think, 1,700 pound payload. So, uh, you know, <laughs> the thing is, if you've ever flown an ultralight, I used to fly ultralights for years, you're just sitting in a chair and you're flying a wing around. And uh, so uh, flying around a drone with some type of uh, connection to it wouldn't be that much different. In fact, that would probably be a lot faster and a lot safer than flying an ultralight around, which uh, uh, there's not a big following on that, but there's plenty of people doing it. Been doing it for many years. Used to build them back in the 80s. So that's just another way of getting, taking some of that excess power between say 10 and three and using it to charge something that you can use as transportation. Now the, the issue with the Tesla, for example, most of those are, uh, well, they're, they've got a 60 kilowatt and they're up to a hundred now. Most of them you'll see are probably going to be the nineties, either the 60 kilowatt hour or the 90 kilowatt hours. And you can see they, they show a, a charger. That's, so that's like a level two charger on a wall. That's 220 volts. That's all level two means. It's using 220, just like you go into your hot water heater, your dryer, or something like that at home, and charging your car with it. But that's 90 kilowatt hours. So if you've only got a battery that holds 30 kilowatt hours, for example, you can't draw 90 kilowatt hours of power out of it. It would take uh, quite a while to try to charge that and uh, the thing is going to run your system down and pull all your power out. Even during the day, uh, maybe I lose 20 kilowatts of power in the middle of the day that uh, I have co potentially coming in. If I've got sun, that if I don't put it somewhere, it gets lost. So I could put 20 uh, kilowatts a day and towards charging a car, for example, without uh, losing any of the power that I use right now because that's just excess power I have coming in. You just have to look at how the systems work. Here's some other ones I put up here. And here's some examples of typical level two chargers. I just took this picture because it has multiple chargers on the wall. Some of these are wired in direct. A lot of them are like that, but some of them can just plug into a, and I don't think I see any in this picture that plug into the wall, maybe. Maybe that one. Yeah, there's one with a plug. See that? It just shows like a dryer plug. So you could actually have an outlet with a plug, plug it in. There's a, uh, I think there's a juice box, what they call a juice box. You can get those up to eight, uh, 60 amps, I think, as high as you can get those. But there's just some different type chargers. This one's pretty common. I've seen these a lot. And then you plug them in uh, to your car. Not even sure what kind of car they've got here. So even on an off-grid system, as long as you've got a uh, plug and you've got the power, you could take any uh, power off your system and charge something if you have enough. It wouldn't matter that you're on an off-grid system is what I'm trying to say. But uh, they're going to run your battery down. So maybe you can do some charging one day, some the next or something along that line. Because you can uh, typically on these, what's one of the things I was going to say about the bolt? You can put on the Chevrolet Bolt, you can, and it's just a plug-in electric. You can put in, uh, kind of like if you're not at home, in other words, it can have a, sh a shorter uh, charge, a logarithm. So if you tell it that you're uh, at a charge station and you're only going to put like an hour charge in it, for example, you can tell it that. And then it will set the charge a logarithm just to handle whatever the current uh at that system will provide it. It will decide uh, what, how it's gonna charge your battery based on how far down your battery is and all that kind of thing. So it takes all those things into consideration, comes up with a charging logarithm that will work for an hour charge. Or if you have two hours, for example, or three hours, you can just tell it, okay, well, I'll be back in three hours and it'll set up a charge logarithm for that particular charger that you're plugged into and charge your car based on the fact that it's only gonna charge for three hours. 
So that's a, a really uh, great idea. Probably most of you, I don't even know about the Tesla. I'm sure it does the same thing. I haven't looked at it, but you know, it's a good idea. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's charging at whatever it's charging at, like with the zero. And then uh, you just have to unplug it, turn it off, power it down, unplug it and go uh, with whatever power you have. So uh, maybe the bike will do the same thing. If not now, it will later. <clears throat> But there's just some other ways to use your solar power and get free transportation, like free gas in a sense. You charge it up when you have uh, power on your system and you drive or ride your bike or whatever. Now, let's go back to the output from these magnums. I just drew little arrows down. Uh, basically, I'm using an e-panel. If you look at the Midnight Solar uh, e-panel, I have various ones and I just couldn't obviously couldn't draw these wires on here so I just kinda took a picture out of one of their manuals I'm showing a 11 kilowatt generator that's what I have uh, on my system which puts out about the maximum power that that one Aquion will take as an input so you want to get things uh, work synergistically and I'll just go in a little bit more So you got your AC. The good thing about this e panel is you have all your AC and your DC wiring. Bus bars are all inside, and then that actually just shows a battery over to the side of it. But the AC output, which is, I think these right up here, is just showing where the AC comes out. Well, okay, so I drew what my AC looks like, which is an output here again into a 300 amp transfer switch. I'm showing the grid meter on the other side of the transfer switch and then the middle is the loads for the house. So my output from my uh, magnums goes into the e-panel which comes out to a transfer switch at the house. If I throw it one way I'm running off the solar, if I throw it the other way I'm running off the grid. So it's an off-grid system but this is grid available. So if I am low on my battery, I can use the grid as my backup, or I could go over and kick the generator on. But instead of using the generator, since I have the grid, there is no connection, though, between the grid and the solar. And there can't ever be any feedback to the grid. So that's the whole point of using a transfer switch. There's no way to get feedback to the grid doing it this way. And then I jumper that power from the solar and the grid over to a secondary transfer switch, 60 amp, and I use that for powering the water heater and the electric stove. And I do that separately so I could actually be running the house on solar, but those two uh, systems I can be running grid or solar because those are the ones that drain the most power. So if I feel like I can make it through the night on my solar, then I can just leave those uh, switched over. And then, like I said, I have a secondary uh, timer on the water heater too. So it only actually only runs during the day. I didn't think that would necessarily work, but it's working fine. And the other thing about it is if I get up in the morning early and need to take showers, I can just walk in, flick it on. It has a manual on off on it as well. Now, on the DC side, I just kind of drew an example of what this might look at. I tap into my 48 volts which is right there in the e-panel. Come through a breaker and I parallel that to two converters, both are 30 amp DC to DC converters, 48 volts to 12 volts DC. Now I just drew one circuit so you kind of see what it looks like. So my output, positive and negative, goes over to two bus bars. The negative will always just go directly to the load. The positive always goes over and then goes to the fuses. And in this example, I'm just showing one uh, off one fuse. I go out through a wall switch over to a light or a freezer or a fan or whatever I might be running DC. There's a number of things you can actually run DC. You can, there's ceiling fans. Freezers are pretty common. Now here's the idea about the freezer. Even if the AC part of the system, the batteries run down, you hit your low battery cutoff and the inverters cut off because the battery is too low on uh, 
on the DC side feeding the inverters in other words if the battery goes down too low the inverters will just shut off so and then you lose your AC however there's still power in the batteries more than enough power to run freezers to run lighting and all that kind of thing so the lighting uh, I have all this DC lighting which are just uh, and I have multiple videos on that on my website uh, you can find the 12 volt DC freezers from Sundancer uh, maybe Frigidaire. There's a, there's a number of them that uh, output uh, those. I think the Sundancer is an Electrolux. So if you look up Electrolux Sundancer, they have three different freezers. And uh, they only pull, I think, seven amps. So it's really not much. It's amazing. You pay uh, extra for them. They're chest freezers. But uh, the good thing is, in fact, it'd be nice if we could buy everything 48 volts so you wouldn't have to use converters. But be that as it may, at least uh, you can tap in your battery your battery might not have enough power to run your inverters but it has more than enough to run your freezers and other loads lighting and so forth so uh, it's just a good way to set up a, especially an off-grid system you always want to use some DC lighting anyway and uh, doing it this way <clears throat> just gives you some backup that uses power that you wouldn't uh, normally use uh, here's the thing to consider about the Aquion. The Aquion when it's at zero state of charge, that's 30 volts. Well, most of your uh, inverters are not going to work below 36 volts. The magnums cut off at 36. Uh, they're probably not ever going to go down to 30 volts. So when they shut off, there's still quite a bit of power still sitting in the battery because the battery just goes to a lower voltage before it's completely out. So you've got that six volts. The other thing about it is, is pulling that power off your Aquion, uh, depending on how much power you're pulling off that battery at any one time, it lowers the voltage of the battery uh, anywhere from say two volts to maybe eight volts. If you're pulling a high amp load and you're pull, trying to pull like 100 amps off your battery, well your, your uh, DC voltage might drop from 48 volts down to 40 if you're pulling high amps and if you keep pulling a high amp uh, draw and let's say it's at night or something then what's going to happen is your battery's going to pull down to 36 volts and as soon as it shuts off it's going to jump back up maybe six volts so it's going to jump back up to like 42 volts as soon as it as soon as it cuts off and then eventually it will float back up to 46 uh, maybe uh maybe that high it's hard to say but it'll sit there and it'll float back up some if there's no load on it and the voltage will gradually uh creep up so if you're the battery's really good for a like i say a low slow draw if you could only draw say 15 amps or something off of it uh, you could do that for a long time the voltage is not going to drop it's just going to slowly go down and then eventually you'll get to 36 volts. But if you're pulling a high amp load on the Aquion, then it's gonna drop a lot of voltage reasonably fast. And once you hit your low battery cutoff, then your inverter shut off. Now they'll come back on. In fact, they may cycle if that's a problem between uh, your low battery cutoff to what the uh, cut in is, the cut in voltage. If that's not high enough, it would cut off at 36 volts and then when they jump back up to say 42, I'm just using that as an example, but I think I've seen it do that. Uh, if your cut in voltage was 42 volts, then it would cut back on and then it would cut back off. It would start cycling. So I did have some cycle uh, issues with these inverters. And basically when you have a master slave, you have another issue, a uh, potential issue with cycling. So <clears throat> you have to uh, look at how all this stuff works. There's so many battery technologies Maybe this one is not going to be sold for a while, but regardless of which battery you end up using, whether it's a, a lithium ion technology, and there's multiple lithium ion technologies. So, uh, they're just, you know, you have multiple flow battery technologies that could be used in residential. It really just depends. You have to make sure that your inverters, your charge controllers, and your battery are all going to work synergistically 
and figure out what your problem areas might be and decide if you can live with that or if you'd rather have a, a battery that does performs uh, differently. Uh, sometimes uh, people just want specific equipment maybe maybe you, you would like Snyder so you have to look at how the uh, look at uh, what it will handle as far as your uh, highest voltage your lowest voltage your cutoffs you have to look at uh, all the specs and then decide what battery you're going to use and see if all that's going to work together sometimes things don't work quite as good as you would want it to maybe uh, you say well you don't want that battery necessarily, you'd rather have something else. So that's what your solar installer does. He decides, looks at all these specs, puts all that out, decides uh, whether you want to do it this way or do it some other way and what kind of things you want to have as far as monitoring. The good thing about the Aquion is there's really not any uh, monitoring required on it. Uh, even with, uh, let's kind of scroll back up a little bit here. Even if you had uh, <clears throat> a system this size could handle probably up to four Aquions and basically you just parallel them in, uh, you don't need to monitor them. There's no overheating problems with the Aquion. It's just, you just look at the specs on it and the write-ups on it. Uh, it's very simplistic to install. It's, uh, you know, it's a heavy battery for the amount of power you get out of it. It has downsides, you could say. But it also has a lot of upsides, it's cradle to grave uh, certified, it can be recycled, and it doesn't just go out on you like some batteries, like a lead acid system, you can have your batteries just basically quit, or especially one battery just quit, which really messes up your whole system. Uh, with the Aquion, it doesn't necessarily do that, it just, uh, you just slowly degrade over time. The cycle life, uh, round trip efficiency, there's just all kinds of things. Uh, your levelized cost of energy for long term use. You have to look at all these things, even uh, how much it costs to get the battery shipped to you, installed. You have to take all these costs into consideration if you're going to compare things fairly across the board. Uh, and generally, when you look at how people are marketing, they don't, uh, they're not putting all these things into perspective they're going to promote their best things about their battery and then they're going to leave these negative comparisons out that might look some other let some other technology uh, might actually be better for you so if you really want to uh, compare things and decide on what you're going to buy you should in fact if you want to be off grid you should go to someone that's off grid that sells off grid that installs off grid because the other issue with most solar companies they're not necessarily out there installing uh, many off-grid systems. That might only be 1% of their business. 99% of their business may be grid tie. Problem with grid tie at the moment is uh, it's not gonna last because a lot of these uh, grids just won't handle but so much power coming back in and they're just gonna have to cut off. They're not gonna be able to buy power from people which uh, is the main attraction at the moment uh, that you can sell power back to the grid, but uh, that's going to go away once they uh, get saturated with that power coming back in. If they can't handle the excess power, <clears throat> you know, they uh, kind of need storage and things like that. Well, that costs money for them. If they don't have it, then they're not going to be able to pay for power coming in. In fact, they're not going to be able to handle the power coming in you're going to get to a point where you're going to absolutely have to put in your own storage if you want to go solar. So what I'm doing with the off-grid, I've just, I'm already there. I'm just already designing systems like that. Now I've got some uh, grid scale examples of storage down here, for example. Pumped hydro is pretty common and we're probably going to get more of it. And basically uh, the round trip efficiency is very good. We probably have, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe 40 uh, plants like that in the United States at the moment. And all they do is use their renewables from solar, wind, or, or whatever they have. And when they have that renewable power coming in that they're not using, they just pump water up to a high level lake. <clears throat> and then when they need the power, they take the water from the lake that's up high, run it down pipes, in other words, penstock. They run it down pipes, run it through a turbine, and they produce power. So when they need it, the water's coming down. 
when they have excess power, they pump the water back up. And that's basically their battery is water power, like hydro, but it's pumped. So uh, the round trip efficiency, the good part about it is the amount of power they put in versus what they get out of it is very good. I think it's uh, maybe around 85%, something like that. So very good round trip efficiency. And everything should be looked at from an efficiency standpoint. Uh, here again, the Aquion's uh, reasonable for uh, efficiency for uh, a residential off-grid and it's been sold uh, for grid scale so apparently uh, the people that, that have bought it thought it was good enough it has so it's positive it has this negative so we'll see how that works out here's another one that you may not have heard of and it's called a gravity battery so if you just search the gravity power module I just pulled these images off of Google probably and how this works is it's let me back up a little bit it's storage that they put into the ground so the pipe in other words it's a pipe that goes into the ground this example I think that I was looking at was 30 foot in diameter so they take some of these old uh, like a fracking well so where you already have a hole in the ground and that's used as a pilot hole where they drill a bigger hole because drilling the pilot hole is a, a big expense to begin with. But if they already have that, then it's easier. They just take this old hole in the ground, drill a bigger hole, put a 30, drive a 30 foot uh, diameter pipe down the ground. That could be, a, a, let's say it's a thousand foot. It's probably not but two or three hundred, but whatever it is. Inside that pipe, they fill that with water and they put a piston in there. Of course, that piston may be 400,000 pounds. I mean, but <clears throat> what happens is, is that piston goes down, for example, it would be pushing water out the bottom. So you've got a closed loop system. The water goes out, comes up, goes through a turbine, generates power. When they've got excess power, same idea as the pump hydro, when you've got excess power from wind or solar, then they use a, a water pump with an electric motor, pump the water down the pipe, which puts the piston back up. So it's a hydraulic system, hydraulic storage in a sense, closed loop, and uh, it can generate whatever it can generate based on how big the system is, but it's all on the ground, all self-contained. You don't lose water to evaporation. And frankly, you don't see it because it's in the ground. So that's a good uh, thought. Uh, I don't think you'll see too many of those in residential use, but uh, maybe it could be, who knows? So I think we've covered everything on the chart. And uh, I can do specific videos later on if anybody needs to know, but uh, that's just the basic concept of how a solar system uh, is wired up panels through breakers into charge controllers which feed uh, charge up your battery and then your battery feeds 48 volts to your inverter the output on your inverter is either 110 or 220 in this case there's two, 220 volt and then uh, a master slave uh, on the inverters is pretty common if you have up to uh, uh, four uh, or more inverters sometimes all in master slave conversion so it can get complicated if you've got a lot of inverters a big system then uh, but in a home I kind of stick with the home residential this is a pretty typical for a residential system uh, but the real uh, problem area would be how much battery storage you have and then uh, the fact that generally you're wasting some power in the middle of the day if it's not getting stored you're wasting it so what can you do with that wasted power well you know there's other things you can make uh, hydrogen you can store hydrogen there's just a, a number of things you can do with power in the middle of the day generally you want people want to in other words they want to heat hot water with it uh, using electric water heater is just one way of eating up uh, excess power that might otherwise go to waste so that's what we do on this one uh, but even then you might still have more power being wasted so storing it is really what you want to do and that just uh, gives you so many days of uh, anatomy of using the system when there's no uh, sun so 
In this system, we're using maybe uh, an average of 25 kilowatt hours a day. Got a 30 kilowatt battery. So yeah, you could run it out at night if you're running your AC or um, we're running mini splits to pull uh, the least amount of power off the system, which is works good. But uh, during the winter time, uh, it's not really enough battery. If you've got some a, a house that uses 25 kilowatts a day, it's just not uh, it's just not enough battery to maintain and run heaters, for example, and that kind of thing. So uh, it seems like it would be enough. Really isn't. Should have uh, at least 60, and we'll probably add another uh, battery to it. But if we can't get another Aquion for it, then that'll make the whole thing a little more complicated because the charge controllers have to be programmed for the battery so if we had to put in let's say another 30 kilowatt hours of a uh, flow battery for example well that uh, depends on where they run off a uh, charge off ac or charge off dc and there's a lot of if ands and buts of how you might wire it up so if we get to that i might do a video showing how that's uh, makes the system work with with that setup with multiple battery technologies Maybe in the future that won't be a big deal, but right now it's still uh, still is an issue as far as charge controllers. So, all right. Well, thanks for watching and uh, watch my channel. Subscribe. Send my link. Thank you.